Uh, okay. Kevin, before just before you do, how many how many have we got? We've got about we've got fifteen participants so far. Yeah. Do you want to start now, or do you want to leave it for another sixty seconds? I hit go. I just had I had just hit go. You have just hit go. Okay. All right. Fine. Well, in that case, let's uh, show. Let's demonstrate. Set, set a good example by actually starting on time. Yes. All right. Okay. So we're going live. Hello, everybody. Thank you very, very much for joining this webinar on the future of cities. My name is Anthony Clayton. I'm, at the, I'm a professor at the University of the West Indies, and I'll be your moderator for this discussion. I'll give you a little background first and then explain the, um, how we're going to manage the next two hours. The, the growth in world population is actually starting to slow and we think it'll reach replacement rate by about 2070. But as a result of the current rate of population growth and urban migration, we're still going to add about another two and a half billion people to urban populations by 2050. Now, if you do the math on this, what that means is that we're going to have to build the equivalent of over a hundred new cities, each one with over 20 million inhabitants, i.e approximately the size of Mexico City today, between now and 2050. Most of them will be in Asia and Africa. If you look at the resource implications, what that suggests is that material consumption by the world's cities will grow. It was about 40 billion tons a year in 2010. By 2050, cities will be consuming about 90 billion tons of materials every year. So what this means is that we're going to need a new model a much more efficient model of urbanization if we're going to contain resource consumption and CO2 emissions over the next several decades. But cities also give us the greatest opportunities to move the world to a more sustainable development trajectory for a number of reasons. One of them is cities give us the, the population density that we need to make <clears throat> economically viable and resource efficient energy, food, water, and transport systems possible. And of course, cities are also our most important assets in terms of human capital. They're the main hubs for innovation in communications, education, and business. Cities can sustain the educational and training institutions that we need to foster innovative capacity and help us to develop the new models of work and business that we're going to need. So the big question is whether cities can adapt and evolve to accommodate the population increase that we're going to see over the next three decades, to deliver the new uh, models of urban living required to give us the much higher levels of energy and resource efficiency, minimize environmental impacts, generate employment, and encourage social integration and cohesion. So can we, for example, make cities into drivers of sustainable change by utilizing smart systems for housing, transport, food, water, waste, sanitation, work and living, and an increasingly important factor, ensuring significantly greater resilience to pandemics, natural and man-made disasters. We have four speakers today, all of whom are working at the cutting edge of these issues. Dr. Joe Ivy Buford, MD, is the Clinical Professor of Global Health at the New York University School of Global Public Health and the Clinical Professor of Pediatrics at New York University School of Medicine. And she's also Chair of the Board of the International Society for Urban Health. She has a very distinguished career at the highest levels in both medicine and public service. And she will be talking about future cities, health and pandemic resilience. Tanya Bedward is the Senior Director of Transport Policy in the Minister of Transport and Mining of the Government of Jamaica as well as a director of the Toll Authority and the Airports Authority of Jamaica. Tanya is leading the development of a new approach to transport policy in Jamaica, and she will be speaking on the future of transport and the implications for urban development. Dr. Walter Viermeyer is reader in environmental business management at the Center for Environment and Sustainability at the University of Surrey. 
is one of the most respected thought leaders in foresighting sustainable business and the future of work and employment. And here we'll be speaking about the future of work and the implications for urban development. And Heather Pinnock, who I hope will join us shortly, is the Group General Manager of the Urban Development Corporation of Jamaica. She leads the transformations of towns and urban centers and the construction of public infrastructure in Jamaica and leads on the development of new patterns of urban settlement and townships. Recently, she commissioned a major study on the construction of Jamaica's next city, which will be designed to be a city fit for the future. This is an exceptionally distinguished panel. All four are thought leaders and actively involved in developing the urban systems of the future. What I'll ask the speakers to do is each to speak for 15 or so minutes, 15, 20 minutes. Please keep your questions for the end. We'll allow all four speakers to speak first, and then we will have about an hour for questions and discussion. And may I now turn the floor over please to our first speaker, Dr. Joe Ivy Buford, MD. Thank you, and I'm uh, sharing my screen, I think. <laughs> Um, good morning, everyone, and uh, thanks very much to um, Professor Clayton for the invitation. And I also want to extend my congratulations to uh, local officials and experts um, uh, on Build Better Jamaica um, who've had the foresight and, and I must say the political courage really to um, take on thinking about new cities and, and new urban developments. Um, I did wanna speak for a moment because it connects to the project um, on the urban health uh, interest of academies of science and medicine worldwide. Um, we do have an urban health working group that I've been chairing uh, for, several, um, for several years and um, the, sorry. Uh, and the, um, we have 21 members each of, of the working group, each of them has been nominated by an academy of science in their country um, to really look at the issue of urbanization, what academies of medicine and science have to offer. And so we've been delighted to link up with Professor Clayton um, and this project. I know some of the academies have been, um, have been involved and uh, we hope to be useful and we hope to learn from what you're, you're doing. Let me start um, by really contextualizing uh, the issue of urban and, and in health, if you will, um, in the global context. And Professor Clayton talked about this briefly. Um, one could argue from a public health point of view that these are the four major public health challenges uh, of our time. Um, the, and certainly this century, urbanization, which we'll talk about a good bit today. Um, there's also the epidemiologic shifts in the nature of disease patterns, uh, the issue of demography, really the aging of the population um, and climate change, which I know has been a factor in your own thinking about um, designing a new city. I just wanna to touch each of, on each of those very briefly and then uh, move into the specifics of this presentation. So this slide really represents uh, a global change uh, in disease incidence, if you will, globally. And I think if you look at the top, bars, you can see the, the dramatic increases in non-communicable diseases. Many uh, would argue that many of these are considerably preventable um, if the right uh, resources are available to people, uh, not just for their behavior change, but also in the environment in which they live. We've had a dramatic, um, uh, pre-COVID at least, dramatic victory in reducing um, the issues of infectious diseases. And um, obviously one of the other rising concerns is injuries, which very much has to do with uh, urban design, urban planning uh, and design in general. Uh, I would point out that the Caribbean ministers of health under the leadership of Sir George Aline uh, actually put NCDs on the map for the United Nations and the world about five years ago. So um, it's a really important uh, regional origins of global attention to this issue. Uh, this slide re really represents uh, the aging, uh, aging population. If you look at the red line, it represents world distribution and um, the, you can see the slope increasing in, uh, on the top line in the less developed countries, lower income countries. This is really a public health um, victory, if you will, people having long, long li longer life expectancy. Obviously we're concerned about the quality of life, but it is a global issue. And I think the really important thing in urbanization is that 
it is a global issue. Aging is a global issue. NCDs are a global issue. It's no longer only a problem of high income countries. Um, and so therefore it has gotten much more global attention. Um, this is a map of uh, urban heat island. This is sort of climate change. This is a long, um, many, many lectures on climate change could be raised and I'm sure some of the issues will be raised. But one, this is a very common effect in cities where uh, the intensity okay. of building exacerbates okay, um, the temperature in cities. And, um, and it has huge implications for working uh, for productivity of the workforce, for energy use in terms of air conditioning, et cetera. And then obviously other issues like sea level rise and uh, emissions for pollution are um, other climate change related effects that are uh, often concentrated in cities. So again, just a final point here. I think the cities have really come to the fore in everyone's attention uh, because of this is a global diagram, Tony, alluded to it. Um, while cities do drive the economies of most countries, often certainly not globally, 70% of GDP um, is generated in cities. They also are provide the majority of greenhouse gas emissions using the majority of global energy and producing the majority of global waste. So there's this balancing act um, in cities where we need to take advantage of the engine for change they provide um, and, uh, and then manage and control over time um, the negative impacts of their presence and their growth. Um, this is an iconic diagram from British colleagues uh, from the 1990s on how health is produced. I think um, the point of the diagram really is one is uh, born with certain uh, characteristics and lives in a family uh, with those and uh, how lifestyle is affected by uh, the resources available really in, social, in uh, communities, both built natural resources and social networks and local communities. And they're all shaped really along the outside by um, socioeconomic, cultural, and environmental conditions, which are policy decisions that governments make, which uh, influence the shape of work, um, the availability of education, um, the decisions about transport. So as we think about this diagram on producing health, um, we are, um, and those of us working in cities have really begun to think about uh, very importantly, the broader determinants of health. Um, these are, there is a, there, 20 years ago, there was not enough of an evidence base to say that if you make X decision in housing or Y decision in transportation, it can be a pro-health decision or a negative decision for health. That has changed pretty dramatically, I think, if you see some of these areas, like urban planners have been the first ones to really, uh, in some instances, re rediscover their roots by thinking about the issues of how do you make healthy environments. Green space is coming up as a huge issue um, for the built environment in cities. And I'll talk about that again a little bit later. Um, obviously the built environment using different environmental materials uh, that are more energy efficient, uh, less damaging to the environment. Um, the uh, housing and others. Transportation is a big one. And um, one of the really interesting, the, the sort of messages around health is minimizing use of cars and dependency on motorized vehicles and maximizing active transport and the infrastructure for bicycles, pedestrians, and other mechanisms of active transport. And as you can see here, I think the big message is the health sector in the red, um, the healthcare delivery system, and the public health system, which often dominate uh, the politics and the power structures in the health sector are really only one of many influences um, that create conditions for health um, in cities. Um, there is a, a concept in the public health and broader literature called health and all policies. It was first um, discussed by the, the Finns about 30 years ago. And I think uh, fits very nicely in thinking about um, urban governance and the importance of, uh, of cities because cities are very close to their constituents. Uh, one can tell whether things are happening that you planned and wanted to implement in cities. And so the key points of the health and all policies approach is that um, health is a, and well-being a citizen is really essential for social and economic development. This has been pretty well ex uh, accepted if you only think about healthcare, you only think about the giant hole in your budget supporting hospitals and healthcare delivery system and rarely think about the positive effects on economy of a healthy and active um, workforce. 
Um, all government policies have impact, um, can be positive or negative, and the goal is to maximize the positive. Um, and that the issue of health equity is at the center of um, the health and all approach. And obviously to work across the sectors that you saw in the bubble diagram means that governance has to be able to work across agencies and political leadership becomes uh, fundamental to success. Um, I wanted to put this up because this is sort of the classic model in global health for uh, how do you deal with the word health? When we hear the word health, we think of health care automatically. And, and down the left side of this diagram is what I would call the medical model. This has really dominated and still to some degree dominates health policy thinking at the global level, which is health system strengthening and the health workforce have been major areas of emphasis of WHO and others, uh, the availability of essential medicines and more recently universal health coverage um, are, are quite dominant themes in health. But on the other side, we have these cross-sectoral models of the health and all policies, um, which I'll talk, which I've shown you the bubble diagram and they're increasingly reflected in the SDGs. And if we, we need to do both, it's not a battle, it's not a conflict. It's really, we've got to deal with the uh, strengthening the medical model components, but also assure that we're addressing um, the broader determinants most effectively. Uh, in looking at the SDGs, which have been important in putting cities on the map, SDG 3 is the classic um, WHO led largely uh, health, if you will, health SDG. Um, and it does include much more attention to non-communicable non diseases, to accidents, to um, other broader uh, focuses on population health other than disease. Um, and the SDG 11 was quite a breakthrough um, when it was added to the sustainable development goals. There had never been any attention to cities at all. And so um, SDG 11 is uh, really reflects the focus on cities, uh, making them inclusive, safe, resilient, and sustainable. And this is goal 11, the details. And you'll notice that on this list, uh, many of the elements that were in the bubble diagram I showed earlier are there. Um, the issue of green space, the issue of transportation, um, the issues of um, climate change, buildings, et cetera. These are all part of attention to goal 11. The UN Habitat is the, um, the UN agency that sort of leads on, um, on SDG 11. They're lar largely planners, but have increasingly taken on um, the health agenda. So part of what we in urban health try to do is bring together the people focusing on urbanization and the people focusing on health and get the two words together. Um, you won't see the health word anywhere in goal 11 and you won't see the urban word anywhere in goal three, but the idea is how do you kind of bring these communities together and the opportunities that you have are dramatic. So Next, this is a, a, a fun diagram about how really urban brings all the SDGs together. I'm not gonna dwell on it, but I think it's a nice way of um, actualizing really the broader determinants uh, of health that link to um, broad issues across the SDGs. Um, so next steps nationally, the UN um, is using a, a one UN framework for urbanization. Um, each country is invited um, to develop a national urban policy. Um, and what we've been hoping is that those will incl increasingly include health. Um, the elements of those policies that would be most promoting health would be intersectoral governance models and alignment of national, regional and local government levels in their policies, um, really broad inclusiveness so that government needs to be strong enough to bring in other stakeholders at national and local level, especially the private sector and civil society, and then looking at these health promoting decisions in other sectors um, as one invests in infrastructure and um, the focus on community being the place-based um, um, emphasis. So I was asked also to address um, COVID and I'm fresh off of our international conference for urban health last week. So I've sort of pulled items out of all of the presentations by experts Really, and I retitle this, it's let, you could say lessons learned. I think for many people, it's been lessons revealed. I think anyone in the urbanization or urban health world has known about um, the importance of cities, has known about the, the issues of disparities, has known about the critical nature of community engagement, but these have really become much more visible because of COVID to policymakers, to opinion leaders, to 
the public in general. So these are the kind of takeaways from uh, last week's conference. The first one I think clearly is that, and we, we even began to use the word equity as a more uh, organ, better organizing force than health. If you get equity in your uh, decision-making for cities, you will get health and you will likely get resilience. And I think this was a, the strongest takeaway from many, many presentations and discussions. So we began to talk about building back better, but also building back fairer. Um, Sir Michael Marmot, I think, has used that term in some of his recent work in London and the UK, but I think this issue of better, greener, fairer is one of the slogans of UN Habitat and raises the equity issue. Um, community engagement, the failure to have done it um, well enough and early enough uh, when there wasn't an emergency was highlighted uh, enormously and um, really very strongly uh, indispensable to success going forward and preparing for and responding to future emergencies, but I would argue just in general in all, overall um, urban planning. Communication was a huge issue, a lot of, of uh, mixed messages. Obviously, social media is a complication I won't go into, but um, a lot of mixed messages from national level, regional level city officials, uh, confusing the public, confusing healthcare workers. So the capacity for communication, especially to the public, was emphasized uh, dramatically and um, also needing to strengthen the healthcare system, but strong messages, especially from colleagues in India, South Asia, uh, Africa, really uh, the emphasis on a healthcare delivery system that prioritizes primary care. Uh, we all give lip service to this. It doesn't happen. It hasn't happened. So I think one of the real messages here in COVID response was the potential importance of primary care had it been more robust and where it was, how invaluable it was in both response and testing and tracing and now in, in making vaccinations available. Um, public health infrastructure, which is different from the healthcare delivery system. PAHO has developed a concept some years ago of essential public health functions, which all um, ministries of health and arguably departments of health at city level need to have. And then um, this last message, message really of kind of continuing to think about urban infrastructure with a health lens. And again, uh, the importance of green space was um, for mental health and physical health was front and center, um, the usual water sanitation systems, active transport, eco-friendly building. Housing was a huge issue. Um, and the message being in a lot of research density in and of itself is not bad, overcrowding is. So building cities in a dense configuration is okay if there are allowances made for, um, for broader public spaces, common spaces and um, unit size that doesn't overcrowd. And then a huge um, emphasis on digital capabilities, both making sure they are baked into the infrastructure that one is funding um, and that also they provide public health data and data to government um, for decision-making, but also uh, data to the public um, when necessary that they're access points for the public. A um, Couple of others, um, planning for sustainable urban economy came up a lot. The vulnerability of small businesses um, during COVID really raised a question of whether there were mechanisms for providing transition support for them until they could reopen. Obviously the workforce there um, creates even more problems. Um, a lot of discussion on governance mechanisms and UN Habitat is working. Uh, they have a governance unit, which is brand new for them, really looking at regulations, legal frameworks that really um, encourage, I think, uh, clarification of local government authority, which varies from country to country. Um, in some countries, local governments have very little authority. Everything is centralized. In others, they have considerable authority. And the idea is where's the balance? And especially in a pandemic, uh, there's a tendency to centralize, which may be important for mobilizing resources, but also the roles of um, central, uh, regional, and, and local governments need to be clear. Uh, and then the final message, which is coming up increasingly in any conference focusing on urban, is the need for balanced development of our urban and surrounding rural areas. A part of it is um, supplying the needs to cities, but part of it is balancing economic development to avoid unnecessary migration into cities and to also um, create a, a bi-directional arrow that really um, provides a sort of holistic approach to um, urban development. And then these are some resources that are 
available from various agencies, especially looking at child-friendly cities, age-friendly cities. I think the reason they're there is if you develop a child-friendly and an age-friendly city, it will be a healthy city. And um, these are kind of all aligned with the broader determinants of health. So I'll stop there and I'll put up our International Society for Urban Health and we're delighted to work with anyone uh, going forward. So thank you very much. Well, wow. Can I thank Professor Buford? That was uh, stunning and a very, very good um, high level overview of all of the issues related to how can we uh, factor in health, health considerations in, uh, in thinking about future patterns of urban development. Well, for those of us, those people who joined late, I'll just remind you that we're going to hold all questions until all four panelists have had a chance to present so that we can see the big picture. So let me now ask uh, Tanya Bedwood to talk about the future of transport and what that means for urban development. Tanya, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Prof Clayton. Uh, let me project here. Okay, thank you again, Prof. Uh, thank you, Build Better Jamaica, for the opportunity to share in this forum. Uh, this is a topic that I hold dear to my heart for more than one reasons. And it's my delight to share and to speak on, you know, the implications of for transport as we move and look towards uh, the future development of cities. You know, Prof Clayton, in, his, in the beginning, in his opening, um, statement mentioned the importance of urban development and cities. And I just want to underscore that urban areas are critical for national development, not just local development. And this is because of the, the, the concentration of economic activities, human capital, et cetera, within this area. Also of paramount importance is the acknowledgement of the, the amount of, well, the, the, the land available in these areas and the amount of such land that is used by transport. And as a consequence, it is important that transport be factored into the overall um, discussion. Now transport is considered, a, or may be considered a derived demand. We talk about the change in, in land use density in urban areas, which as um, Dr. Joe stated earlier, that it can be a good thing and it can be a bad thing. It's important that it's managed and derived demand will certainly be associated with increased density because people travel for a reason. And these, this is what drives, for example, the, the, the incidence of congestion within cities that we're experiencing. And we know this has spill off implications for the concentration in, and increased emissions of greenhouse gases and the negative impact that has on climate change and even on our urban um, environment. And it, it does contribute to the urban heat island phenomenon that uh, the previous presenter spoke about as well. What we're noticing is that certainly there has to be, the, the discussion has been around the need to shift from the current pattern of moving vehicles or the thrust to moving vehicles to more so concentrate on moving people. And we have seen in recent years a disruption in a number of, of innovation that has vast implications for the transport sector. And three of these that was highlighted by one researcher as quoted on the slide is first and foremost of motor vehicle automation, electrification, as well as the, the whole concept of ride share, which I will look at, um, but in more details, my presentation will be focused more so on motor vehicle uh, automation. Now autonomous vehicle development or, or driverless vehicle as it's called is one of the most disruptive uh, patterns and developments in the transport sector that has happened in recent years. And we 
for a lot of developing countries, this is seen as a concept. But if you look at what's happening in the developed world, as I will highlight later on, you realize that this is actually morphing as we speak. And it, the, the, the technology is being mainstreamed into the transport sector gradually. With what we've seen is that with an increase in motor vehicle uh, electrification or electric vehicles rather, and the incorporation of ICT in the sector, there has also been an increased development or the pace at which AV development has, has happened has increased significantly. And this augmentation has resulted in, in a lot of tests being carried out, as you will see later on. And we talk about motor vehicle automation as depicted on the slide. We're talking about uh, a situation or a pattern that exists, a phenomenon that exists on a spectrum. So we're talking about a range of six levels of automation or five uh, based on the Society of Automotive Engineers classification. At the very bottom end, where it, it, it's motor vehicles as we know it now, with, which is fully manual um, and includes no automation. And then there are different levels of automation depending on the kind of assistance that the vehicle provides for the driver. To the upper end of the spectrum, which is referred to as level five, where motor vehicles Now there are different, there are numerous companies that have been testing um, autonomous vehicles within the last more than two decades. Um, and this has intensified more so. And a lot of these companies are manufacturing, motor vehicle manufacturers that we're familiar with on a daily basis. Um, we talk about Mercedes have been doing a lot of work, BMW, even Nissan, Honda, um, General Motors. And of course, you would know that one of the forerunners is Tesla as well. And Tesla has been one of the advocates for the transition um, to autom autonomous vehicle as the industry continues to work on this um, development. What we've also seen are purpose-built entities uh, and firms that have been developed to undertake specific testing and work towards the mainstreaming and development of autonomous vehicles. And one of this, and one probably one of the most prominent is Waymo. Waymo started in as far as 2009 by Google, and it was just started as a project to look at driverless vehicle. But the extent to which the technology has developed and to which the, 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 the testing has been carried out and the industry is growing, we've seen Waymo morphed into its own organism over the years. So Waymo is now a standalone subsidiary of Google, which, is, which has undertaken probably the most work in terms of the number of tested on-road miles for autonomous vehicles and looking at the various, um, the various elements that will impact the operation of autonomous vehicles within cities. And I'm sure we would have heard a lot of, um, we would have heard certainly of, of instances where in, in Arizona, for example, there was a crash and there was a fatality associated with that crash uh, where a pedestrian was killed um, by an autonomous vehicle. And this had set back, this, this had created some amount of setback for the development of this technology and the research, but has this has they have since moved past that. And what we realize in terms of how autonomous vehicles operate, and even in terms of the principles that drive the development of autonomous vehicles, is that the human error is really at the heart of motor vehicle crashes, for example, that includes pedestrian as well as the motor vehicles. And it is really that the, 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 the challenge of trying to have both operate in the same environment simultaneously 
while we make the transition. And we will look at this um, a little more in terms of some of the factors that has to be considered. So essentially the commercialization of autonomous vehicles in the short term is intended to first and foremost improve safety and efficiency as well as accessibility within the transport sector. And we know that there are a number of secondary spin-offs and implications that will have. Um, Prof spoke earlier about whether or not um, the city could be the nucleus for change and transport is one such area. Um, transport is the vein of the city and therefore the, the urban response must be preemptive in terms of how we uh, prepare to, to, to incorporate autonomous vehicles within our environment. From a global perspective, a tremendous amount of work has been ongoing and based on the KPMG's state of readiness study, the last one published for 2020, I have outlined on the slide the countries which are in the top 10 in terms of the, the advancement with the technology. And this is, the, 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 the state of readiness is assessed on the basis of the factors which are outlined on the right side of the slide. So it speaks to the extent to which safety has been addressed, liability, legislation, and other regulations, uh, the whole, um, administrative environment, ethical considerations, etc. And we see that Singapore is at the top of the, 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 the scale right now. And I must point out that this is not static because depending on the amount of work and the extent of the work undertaken and advancement undertaken by each state, the state, the order may change for the next um, report output. I've also included Japan, which comes in at 11, uh, position 11. And this is critical because when you look at it, you know, you'll see a lot of developed countries um, outlined on the slide. But in terms of the implications for developing country like Jamaica, it is grave as the country, countries like Jamaica are not manufacturers of automobile. We are consumers. And therefore, a country like Japan, we also import from the United States. And if, if, if the transition is happening in the sector, then ultimately, it will have implications for us. So this is the state of the street as we know it now, um, pre-AV era. And we, we, we would have also heard from the earlier presenter, the implications of, you know, not incorporating a lot of non-motorized travel within the transport environment. And we see now a significant amount of the streets within the cities dedicated to motor vehicles. And we will see how the, the, autom the, the, the autonomous vehicle era rather will intend, will change um, that phenomenon. So essentially, autonomous vehicles certainly without a doubt will impact land use. Um, the, it will also have implications for street design and traffic management as this will require that smart streets be developed um, autonomous vehicles include technology which essentially have motor vehicles being able to communicate among themselves as well as communicate with the infrastructure. And there's also importantly from the, the, the administrative perspective, the relevant data clearing house. So that kind of infra infrastructure importantly has to be in place to help with the management of cities. Um, so we're looking at smart cities. We're also looking at expecting to possibly see a change in how people travel, uh, people's travel pattern, as well as motor vehicle ownership. And this will be associated with the way land use is changing. We're seeing and, and we're expecting for a lot of cities 
that there will be increased density and in, increased density in a manner that facilitates and encourages mixed use developments so that persons would be required to travel less. We're also seeing the development of, of um, mobility substitutes where a lot of persons are move, working from home, for example. And this we would have experienced um, to a large extent with the pandemic. As I've always said, the, the pandemic has served to even thrust us much faster into the fourth industrial revolution. And I think that these are factors that we have to consider. So the within in the auto, autonomous vehicle era, we're looking at what can be deemed as the new urbanism as I like um, the National Association of City Transport Officials in the US has deemed it. And what you see, the principle of new urbanism is it, it, it embodies a design that advocates safety. It embodies a design and a layout and a retrofitting of cities that prioritize people and in so doing would prioritize modes of transportation such as walking, biking, that reduces a reliance on, on, on um, motor, motorized vehicle or motorized transportation. As well, there is the prince, another principle is that it will be aimed at, or it should be aimed at, at facilitating equity in terms of how the benefits within the city are accessed. Um, decisions within the city in terms of uh, traffic movement, etc., should be data driven and will be data driven based on the smart environment within which the city is managed and operates. And therefore technology must be used as a tool for the city, uh, the future of the city that will see autonomous vehicle um, still operating within the space. And it will no longer be the, the primary factor on the street as not only will different types that, that of transportation that encourages um, pedestrianization, et cetera, increase, but shared automobile um, will also become, and mass um, transportation will become uh, a thing of the future city. Among, so the implications for Jamaica, they're significant. And as I had stated- um, sorry, sorry to interrupt, we just have to, um, ask you to speed up a little bit now. Okay, right. So as we, uh, the, the, the implications for Jamaica are grave. And as I pointed out, um, we're, mani we're not manufacturers, but rather importers of vehicle. Um, from Jamaica's perspective, we're currently in the process of reviewing a national transport policy. And whereas these are not matters that are existing right now, um, certainly the policy is forward looking and therefore will address ways of um, considerations for uh, these uh, technological developments such as um, autonomous vehicles. We also see, um, if you look in and around Kingston, you will see where Trans where you, you see where the state of the city or the way in which the city is developed is changing. Um, so you see areas where um, single family units are being converted, areas that hold single family units are in combination being converted to high rise developments. And therefore we have to encourage the efficient use of the road space and transportation and as such encourage mass transportation within the city. And we, based on how the city in, in Jamaica, based on how transportation in Jamaica has evolved, what I must highlight is that it is not, I don't believe it is a matter of if autonomous vehicles will get to Jamaica, it's a matter of when. And we also need to bear in mind that we're also transitioning to more to auto, um, electric vehicles and an autonomous vehicle will be an electric vehicle. So therefore it is important that 
the era that we, what we experienced with our older cities where we had closed grid iron pattern laid out for the cities were developed um, limited setbacks and now we have to operate within that space that we be preemptive in ensuring that we prepare as much as possible um, for such uh, a transition. And I just want to say thank you. Um, I think in closing, I must reiterate that it is important that in laying out cities that in Jamaica, we road infrastructure development accounts for a significant portion of, portion of government's budget. And certainly the payback will be over generations. And it is therefore critical that the cities that we create now would be relevant to the future generation. And so that it is one that they can build on for future generation since they will be absorbing some of the debts. I want to say thank you for the opportunity to present and I will take any questions at the end of the session. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Tanya. Um, it's quite common, it's said that uh, change sometimes it takes a little bit longer than you expect to get started, but then it usually happens faster and the impact is more extensive than you expected. <clears throat> I, 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 the, if you look at the projections for the transition to electric vehicles, some of them show that uh, by about 2040, something like 90-95% of the vehicles on the road will be electric. And of course, that is a parallel trend with the uh, move to autonomy, autonomous vehicles. And uh, here in Jamaica, we don't make cars. Uh, one of the, as you pointed out, so whether we like it or not, there will come a time when all the vehicles that we can import will be electric and autonomous. And that means that we really have to uh, prepare now. We have to think about the infrastructure. We have to think about the pattern of urban development, which will be supported by a very different mode of transport. Thank you very much, Tanya. You're okay, and hand the, give the floor now to Dr. Walter Viermar to talk about the future of work. Walter. And I've just avoided um, the most frequently said thing in these conferences, which is you are on mute. Um, hello, my, my name is Walter Viermeyer. I'm from the um, University of Surrey. And I hope you can see the screen. Yes, excellent. Um, right, I am. I'm humbled. Um, first of all, I'm, I'm, I'm very grateful for the for the wonderful opportunity to to, to share a couple of ideas with you, um, but also um, the the topic of, of of future of work and the implications for urban development, in, for, particularly for Jamaica, is a, is a huge topic in its own right. And I'm humbled by by the efforts of um, um, Joe Joe Ivy and um, uh, Tanya. Um, to pack such a huge agenda into something nice, 15 minutes long, um, compact and so on and so on. I'm not sure whether I can, I can deliver um, that one um, with the same alacrity. Um, I just would like to say a couple of things about what, what I think um, makes this future vision thing um, so much more difficult. Um, I then want to talk a little bit about um, the future of work, um, then about the future of work organization, because the organization, both physically, but also conceptually and, and managerially, um, is, is really behind the whole discussion about urbanization, about living in cities, and so on, and so on, and so on. And then, then from that, I'm going to go um, much closer into cities, I'm going to get physical about what all of that means with um, um, about the cities. Um, just, just to start, <clears throat> um, we are looking at, at a change in the next 20, 25 years. And most of those, those projections are, are both wild and very, very, very vague um, in a way. And that is because the dynamic, uh, dynam uh, not only because of the dynamics of, of technology that is, has been, been um, quite fundamental and very, very fast moving, but also because there are many, many different factors coming together. So, just at the turn of, 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 of this millennium, there was no Facebook, there was no Instagram, there was no TikTok. Um, we used to use faxes. Um, we had very expensive telephony um, and then the workforce globally migrated. Um, now, look at, at, at the change we've, we've, we've experienced in the last 20 years time and think about how fundamentally different 
2041 would look like. And then put yourself into the shoes of, 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 of um, poor Tanya and Ivy, um, and try to figure out how um, um, we can now make decisions so that for that future, we know better ways to live together in, in urban areas and to, to transport our, um, ourselves around. It is not just the technology. I think we also have increasing system complexity in terms of global interdependencies between different factors and different policies and different, uh, different developments. We have networkings um, that allows us more and more to live in a globalized world. Um, the, the black swan event like the pandemic we had, I think we can see many, many more of those ones as well. Um, we see greater um, inequity in access to resources, in livelihoods and in livability. Um, of, of, of um, uh, people and there's in societies uh, societies a greater unhappiness about the status quo yeah. and and I think that that disruption um, is, is, is is sometimes quite pal palpable and within all of those we also need to accommodate climate change and biodiversity loss and, and um, 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 sea level rises and, and all the other um, natural system uh, disruptions that we have. And we need to do all of that. So we need to cater um, for all of that um, with, with public finances that are getting thinner and thinner and thinner. Um, and I think that's, that's quite a fundamental um, a problem for that. What we do know about the future is, is that um, it won't be at all like the past. So we cannot perpetuate our past way of thinking and our past way of solving problems into the future. Um, and more importantly, if you look at the sustainability agenda, if you look at the ethical agenda, if you look at the overall te um, technology agenda, we know that the future cannot be anything like the past. You know, the future must be a radical diversion from, from the past. And that makes the whole discussion we're having here both much more conceptual, much more challenging, but also a lot more exciting because the, 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 the vision we have here is, is trying to find um, a future of work that is meaningful, a future of Jamaican cities that are livable and enjoyable, and a future of, of, of Jamaica that is hopefully more sustainable. In employment terms, um, I think um, people will change jobs much more often. We have already the gig economy, we have more career interruptions. Um, and that typically means that um, with people moving from one, from one company to the next, that the loyalty towards one individual company is being replaced by loyalty towards a particular subject matter. And therefore the motivation is fo focusing much more towards intrinsic passion for content or process so in other words, we are not seeing anymore the IBM persons, you know, the blue suits and blue ties and that kind of stuff. Um, we see people who are computer systems engineers and they do a particular, they, they plow a particular furlough in, in their particular lives for that. Um, in terms of work, um, we will have IT systems that are becoming much more complex, but also much more inevitable. Um, and with the increasing in IT systems and the complexity and capabilities of IT systems, you also see a greater bifurcation. Um, we have fewer leaders and many, many more service jobs. So therefore the futures are much more towards um, jobs that involve creativity, that involve innovation, but also social skills, empathy, problem solving skills, networking, and so on and so on are essential for success. How this, work, how this affects work organization, I think is fairly straightforward. Um, we need more skills and all the future of work reports that, that um, um, I've, I've been, been pilfering in the last couple of weeks to prepare myself for this, um, um, show that we need a lot more skills. Um, most of the not so good reports then say, yeah, then everybody needs to be more skilled. Um, I think that's a bit lack, that, that doesn't really have a lot of um, differentiation. We need particularly more technical, social, cognitive, and emotional intelligence. It is not anymore somebody who can do a physical job, but it is about the human to human interactions. It's about the human to society interactions and so on and so on. And within that, for the future of cities, we've got um, two really important um, dimensions. One of them is we have a continually radical separation of place of, of, the, of the place from the content of the work. Where you are, doesn't define anymore what you do. So since the Middle Ages, and in, in, in Asia since 2000, 
500 BC or so, um, we have had the bright city lights attracting people from rural areas into urban areas because that's where the jobs are. With IT, with remote working, with um, the separation of place from content of work, that drag into the city doesn't exist anymore. For example, here in London, um, HSBC um, has said of the 5,000 people that used to work in their head office in, 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 in the city, they're probably going to use 100. Everybody else is going to work from home. And then what that means is they need better IT systems, but they can live in a beautiful countryside. There is no need for them to work, to, to have highly skilled, highly technical, highly in demand skills with the place of work in the city. And I think that affects transportation, that affects quality of life. They don't have to sit in the British transport system for an hour and a half, um, the commuting things. But that also um, affects the way in which human beings interact as employees at the workplace. Um, mobility of work also accelerates much faster than the mobility of labor. So with the IT revolution, with um, artificial intelligence, automations in, in, in industry 4.0. Um, it is much easier these days to work from home um, or to work anybody else, uh, anywhere else. And the great promise is that you can work wherever you want to, um, to, to, uh, to get your job done. The problem of that is that if anywhere, if you can do, if, if, some, if, if you can do your job anywhere, somebody can do the job anywhere for you. So there is a danger that actually that mobility of work is causing real problems for unskilled labor. We also see a greater increase in labor diversity. We already have the discussion about an aging society, um, but what kind of gender you have, where you're born, um, race um, and, and an age are all issues that actually fade more and more into the past because for most people, um, that really doesn't matter. Good example of, um, of, of, of that is a, is a, a former a student of mine, a PhD student. He works for an international forklift truck company. In the last four years, he set up a special, a special unit for, for the kind of work he's doing. Um, that unit has 60 people um, operating in 30 different countries. Um, and he has seen, as, as head of that, he has seen those, those um, 60 people. Of, of those 60 people, he has seen two people once. Um, for most of, the, uh, of, of his colleagues, he is an email address um, and, and a face um, on, on, on Zoom. And, uh, and I think that requires special personal skills, but it also questions the need why people are actually moving around at all. Um, so tasks that will, can be mobilized will be, and we have a much more organizational approach about the ecosystem workforces, about groups and teams that are virtual, but also collaborating and synergizing. And that goes via IT, and that goes via Zoom and Teams and also the other bits and pieces I don't necessarily like. The other movement we have at the moment is servicization, that actually in the um, development of products, it becomes less and less important what kind of physical artifact we're trying to sell. And it becomes much more important what the services we're offering. And in Tanya's um, discussion, sorry, um, Ms. Bedford's um, discussion, apologize for that, um, ab about um, the, um, automatic um, self-driving vehicles, AVs, um, is, is a really good example for that. Um, because um, if you don't need to drive yourself, why not order your, your stuff from, from your local supermarket and get your car to pick it up? Why not get your car to pick up your, car, uh, your, 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 your kid from school? Um, in fact, you know, the police, we've, we've had been, been, been discussions about this. Um, one of the nice anecdotes was um, um, one of the police officers talking about um, automatic vehicles. Um, um, we had a presentation and afterwards he came to me and he said, could you perhaps link facial recognition with instructions for the car so that if there's a person of interest who's using any of the cars, um, we can just lock the doors and they drive themselves, the car drives themselves to the police station. I mean, you know, um, the behavioral changes that, that these things are forcing are, are phenomenal. And I think we need to think about those. What this means for a city is the separation of content of, of work from place of work. 
you know, um, if you can sit in, in downtown Kingston and work for a company in Singapore where this picture is from, cool. You know, what this means about remote working, very, very important. You also probably can uh, face, face customers that in reality, you probably never, never see. So the need for travel is far less, you know, um, but the material delivery and the transport systems we have is far, far greater. So we find less people being moving, although conceptually they probably move more from job to job and less from place to place. There's a greater transience of the work content because if somebody can do your work or the work content is changing as well, is it, it becomes quite important. Um, and, and therefore what makes people want to stay in Kingston or in Montego Bay or in, in Guildford or in London is not the content of the work and is not the job anymore. What makes people want to stay is the social fabric, the social identity for things. And I think that's something that we need to figure out in, in, in the development of cities. And therefore, it, you know, cities to be, be attractive, livable and sustainable, I think, um, need to have low crime, nice schools, affordable houses, livers drive, more opportunities for local communities um, to, to come together, to have physical meetings um, and so on, so um, and so on, so on. That also requires mixed forms of accommodations, um, flat shares, multiple generations coming together. You know, the boomerang daughters. I mean, I've got a daughter, and I can I can see her um, coming after her university life to come back to 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 um, to Guildford, where I thought, well, maybe you want to have your job somewhere else. Nothing personal. Um, a greater dissemination of learning education, um, and I think for Jamaica, that's an interesting one as well because. Um, there is a lot of brain drain going on for Jamaica. Um, you know, young, young, young people go to university somewhere else and stay there. You know, now with a distance learning program and an excellent university as um, is as UWA, what is the point of brain draining to another place when actually people can do the job here and there as well? So it's a separation that that really makes uh, make, um, uh, makes makes much more. Um, important and therefore the core part for a city is the core periphery interactions. It is the material exchange between the rural, um, the, the supporting rural context, and the um, uh, design for the for, um, for the city in the urban context. Therefore, the biggest trait economically is information and problem solving. The biggest trait physically is the materials and supporting for those for those things and therefore from a transport perspective it is about access to regional and international trade through distribution hubs local goods through local de um, um, uh, deliveries and then designing in the physical um, provisions for um, for resilience um, from a from an urban planning perspective this is a part particularly interesting thing because for the last 60, 70 years, we've been designing cities with lots of car parking spaces. Now, if, there's a, if, 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 if there, there are automatic vehicles that can be driven by anybody, the ownership of my car becomes really not that important. All, all I need is a, is a mobility contract with somebody who can, who can maintain um, the self-driving car um, so that whenever I want to have a car, whenever I want to, to have mobility, that service is being delivered in, in, in that terms. So why would I want to have a car park? Um, I don't need a car. I just get one when I want one. And if I don't need a car park, why do we design cities that have lots of open spaces plastered over with car parks? Emotionally, I think um, cities must become places to support creativity, resilience, and that social touch, that social identity, that work-life balance. Um, in terms of infrastructure, we already have a greatly privatized and, and commercialized um, infra infrastructure system, which will take into account um, the um, health provisions that, that Joe Ivy has been talking about, but also the transport um, uh, discussions we've had. How the whole thing is, is then going to be um, supported um, through through um, energy provision is a, is a different story, but that could be um, done through a mixture of, of, of um, a re reduction in, in consumption, um, but also an increase in radical increase in electrical um, uh, in renewable energies. So future cities therefore need to be built in flexibility, health and system level res um, 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 resilience. And I think in that case, I, I fully support Joe Ivy's suggestion of um, um, health to all, but I would call that sustainability for all um, and sustainability in all policies. Um, we probably need fewer roads, 
more social spaces, more livabilities, um, and um, we need to have further policy ideas to, um, to design in um, sustainability, energy autarky for every new build, democratization of land use decisions um, in, in, in terms of local government and local parts. And cities become not just places where people can go to work and then commute out again because the city just isn't, isn't that nice, but they become cultural landscapes with service provision um, and a greater separation of the content of work from the place of work than ever before. Um, what this means for identity of individuals, that's a difficult question, but I think that's also a question that we cannot really um, um, address in a, in a discussion about um, the future of cities in the next 40 years, because we will need more people um, to, to um, mop up and to cater for um, the, the great dysfunctional side effects that we have about this, um, including um, isolation, including um, greater loss of, of identity to its um, and, 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 and um, gaming. Um, so that's where we are. Thank you very much. I, I hope I haven't been too long. Uh, wow, Walter, uh, thank you. That presentation was challenging in so many ways. Uh, one of them, of course, is that um, it's going to, uh, there's this whole issue of the extent to which our identities are currently bound up yeah. in what we do, our jobs. And if that changes, we'll have to change the way we, we think about ourselves and our reasons for existing. The second challenge, and I'm sure there's actually many more, but let me just highlight three. The second challenge is what it means for many of our existing institutions, like for example, universities, especially the predominantly teaching universities, um, because why do you need to have academics on your payroll anymore? Uh, would it not be cheaper to go and get some very brilliant academics from, um, for example, we could go and hire them from India, uh, where they are still cheaper and the quality is excellent. And then we wouldn't have to have all these expensive people sitting around on the payroll anymore. We could just you hire could people to do it. In, you know. Well, <laughs> so many of the existing institutions may actually fail or at least have to be transformed as we go forward into this new future. And the final thing, this is uh, just an interesting harbinger of possible future change. Since a number of employers have started insisting that everybody goes back to work physically, a number of people in some case, in the US, it's something like 30 to 40% of people are saying, we're not going. This time in our lives has been a point where we have been forced to reevaluate everything that we do. And we do not want to go back into how the situation was before. Some employers have responded by <laughs> increasing wages to try and tempt people back. But a lot of people are saying, we are not going to go back into the old pattern of work. So it seems that the COVID pandemic may have actually um, accelerated this transition to a very different world of work. Uh, I can see there's a lot of questions going to come, but let's hold that back for a few more minutes because we now have Heather Pinnock, who is the, uh, runs the UDC, the Urban Development Corporation of Jamaica. And she is the person who is actually going to make all of this happen in Jamaica's next city. Heather, the floor is yours. Thank you, Prof, no pressure at all. Um, thanks for that and thanks colleagues for your presentation. I am going to quickly go over to sharing my screen and giving you a presentation now about the future of Jamaica's, ur or Jamaica's urban future. Let me start by saying one, that I'm a graduate of the Build Better Jamaica program. I have worked some years with Prof and the Institute of Sustainable Development team at University of the West Indies. And I think that has shaped a lot of what has gone into the work that I am now doing with the Urban Development Corporation. Then I want to say that the Urban Development Corporation is an agency of the government of Jamaica and our direct portfolio minister is the prime minister and that we are primarily and implementation agency. So whereas we've had a lot of conversations so far that looked at um, um, academic and research um, perspectives as well as policy perspectives from one of our ministries, 
I'm going to speak a little more about as an agency how we are how we will be taking that implementation forward. So, and also I should say that I represent a very, very large team. The Urban Development Corporation has up to a thousand work staff. And so I'm, I'm representing them. A few of them are here on the um, panel, uh, on the, in the participant list today. So where there are tough um, policy and scientific questions that I can't answer, I hope that they'll be able to respond. So let's talk about next city. Um, in the year 2017, the government of Jamaica made an announcement that it was going to look at long-term climate resilience planning for Jamaica. And that was embodied in a project that they called at the time Third City, because at that time we were considering where next, because the, Jamaica currently has two official cities, the capital city, Kingston, where, which is the administrative capital, and Montego Bay. And so the thought was, do we need a third city, a, space, a place that would be properly and fully planned and would be climate resilient and would be smart and all of these things. And so let's embark on a process to, to determine how we get there. And UDC, the Urban Development Corporation, was invited to lead this process. And I will say that over the years in the planning and the research that we have done, we recognize that we don't just want a third city, we want to be clear on what would be Jamaica's next city. And we recognize there that the next city could be the development of one of our existing towns, one of our burgeoning towns, and that the next city could will also include plans and standards and, and um, vision that can be applied to a number of our urban centers, not just a single location. And so that's how we got to next city. And from next city, you will see it's, it's written here and presented here as NXTCTY. And why is that? If any of you have ever had a, a instant message conversation with a teenager or, or any young person, any millennial, you will know that they no longer use um, vowels. So in, in doing some of our planning and in doing some of our marketing, we have moved to using NXTCTY which for next city really looking to the future where they may not be vowels. So let me take you through our conversation. So let me start by talking quickly about the Jamaican context. So Jamaica is a small island developing state and we are divided into 14 parishes as you can see here on this map. The two, the two cities that we have existing are Kingston and Montego Bay, one on the southeast coast and one on the northwest coast. You will note that they are both coastal cities. We have six, six parish capitals beyond Kingston and Montego Bay that are clearly coastal towns. And this is an important consideration when you look at Jamaica's development and planning for long-term climate resilience. Jamaica has a population of 2.173 million, according to the 2019 statin um, figures, even though that figure is much higher and closer to 3 million, if you listen to some other sources. And based on that population, we do have an increasingly urban um, population. And right now, cities account for about 32% of Jamaica's population, but they continue to grow. However, even though only 32% of the population may be in cities, 82% of our population lives close to or along the coastline of Jamaica. You will note from looking down even at this map that geographically, a lot of the center of the island is mountainous and therefore is not as easy to, to do large scale development. Another important consideration in looking at Jamaica's current urban context is that we have significant infrastructure at or along our coastlines. So as I said, the two cities are at the coastlines or two international airports, or two main, because we have other international airports, or two main international airports are attached to these two cities. And they are also at or near sea level. We have major investments in ports, airports, um, social facilities, including hospitals, courts, and other civic facilities, as well as other major private sector investments like hotels and business offices, um, and a lot of our our um, infrastructure, our road network, our energy networks are all very much um, in, exposed to or close to our coastal zones. And this is a serious consideration in doing long-term planning for Jamaica. 
So next, let's talk about Jamaica's vulnerability. Jamaica is an extremely vulnerable island based on the Environmental Vulnerability, vulnerability Index, sorry. And if we look at um, or the possibilities and the impacts of, of um, the hazards or natural hazards, the likelihood is great. So let's just look first at sea level rise. At two meters of sea level rise, the runway for our, the airport at Donald Sangston, Montego Bay would be completely lost as would most of the um, coastal tourist town of Negril. If we reach to 10 meters of sea level rise, we would lose Kingston and other major cities in St. Catherine, Clarendon, St. Elizabeth, and West Milan, including the complete loss of the current town of, of Negril. These are the things we must give consideration to. These are the things we have given consideration to in looking at the options and the places that we can use for long-term development of urban, of urban areas and urban centers in Jamaica. Um, and let's talk a bit now about the impact of, of climate-driven um, events, because we're looking again at long-term climate planning. Of course, it is difficult to plan because um, the, the, the changes and the impacts have been increasing exponentially. So it is difficult to plan, but we've used our best models to determine how what, or what, I, what are some of the worst cases that we can imagine. In Jamaica, we have had instances where we have lost a single event, a single tropical storm or hurricane event can wipe out so much of our development, so much of our GDP. And as an example of that, Hurricane Dean damaged, the damage from Hurricane Dean was worth about 24 billion Jamaican dollars, which is about just under 3.5% of our GDP. That is actually a mild example. If we look at the effects of Hurricane, sorry, Tropical Storm Erica on the island of Dominica, another small island developing state in the Caribbean. The effects of Tropical Storm Erica on Dominica it was the result was a complete elimination of their, of their GDP. The cost was more than their GDP and the effects of the aftermath of that tropical storm, it was not even a hurricane, was enough to set the country's economic and physical development back by almost two decades. These are things we must consider in, in doing long-term planning for a small island developing state like Jamaica. So how has the government of Jamaica been responding? Um, the government of Jamaica, the GOJ, has taken a few steps, I shouldn't say a few, quite a few steps to address this. And indeed we look at mitigation, but of course in a small island state like Jamaica, the we produce, we or our, our Greenhouse gas emissions are negligible in comparison to the amount of, of effects that we have when I use examples like what has happened with, with um, certain weather events. And so we much more, even though mitigation is important, for us it is even more important that we look at adaptation and building resilience to climate change so that we can hope to survive and ultimately thrive in what is likely to be a difficult future. And so what has the government of Jamaica done? One of the key things that has happened is just, just in the past year, there is a new specific and defined government portfolio called the Ministry of Housing, Urban Renewal, Environment and Climate Change, which looks very specifically at these things. This is an important focus of the government in recognizing the role of the state in addressing um, national response to climate change and, and those threats. The other thing that has happened is looking at long-term climate change resilience planning and investments. And quite a bit of that is being facilitated through the Ministry of, of Finance and through its um, entity, the Planning Institute of Jamaica, which facilitates government interaction with international development partners, but also with the UDC's parent ministry, the Ministry of Economic Growth and Job Creation, um, which is a ministry that really drives development both at a physical and at an economic level in Jamaica going forward. And therefore, these are the agencies and entities that have been working together. And I should add, um, a key part of this is sustainability. So as we go forward, we'll be engaging other ministries, such as um, Tanya's ministry, um, which is transport, in how we go forward. So what we've really been doing so far is working on that groundwork. So. Let me talk about some of the groundwork that has been done. We um, started with looking at 
using a very scientific approach to, de to determine what should be and what are the guiding principles for our urban futures as Jamaica. And the first, uh, the first um, element of that was a multi-criteria site selection methodology. And what this is, is applied scientific techniques in processing geospatial and hazard data and climate impact data to determine which areas in Jamaica were best suited for development. Of course, in doing that, there are some exemptions. So certain areas like um, the existing cities, um, existing large conservation areas like the Coptic country were exempted. And then we looked at how, what were the physical areas in Jamaica suitable for the kind of development needed for urban growth across the country. The second phase of that was looking at horizon scanning and foresight assessment, because we recognize that a city does not merely grow or develop simply because you want it to be, simply because you found a suitable portion of land, a suitable location does not mean that a city will grow or, that, or even that an urban center will grow. So the second phase of looking at the um, groundwork, the second level of the groundwork that was done was looking at the economic base and social base for the development of urban centers. And under this horizon scanning and foresight assessment um, element, we looked at examining world trends to determine the issues, the kinds of issues and concerns, things like mobility, things like connectivity as raised by Tanya and as raised by Walter and including and at the time when we did that, there was some amount of, but not to the degree that it now is important, of consideration about public health and public health, particularly in settlements and areas where there is dense occupation. And so the matters raised by Joe earlier regarding public health have become even more important. And this goes to show the dynamic nature of this level of urban planning and this level of future planning and long-term planning is that things happen along the way that make you realize these have to be included. So a pandemic was, no, it was not in anyone's thought in 2017 and 2018 when we started this work. But of course, it is top of mind now as we move forward in the year 2021. A pandemic is something no one thought of, but it is something that we recognize as an important part of planning and developing our urban futures. And so the second part of the horizon scan and foresight, foresight assessment was looking at the steps Jamaica needs to take to prepare for urban economies and planning of the future. And that is exactly um, the kind of thing that having a pandemic has made us realize we must include further as we go on. So let me go a little more into the first part, the suitability analysis. So out of this, uh, in this um, activity, the team reviewed, analyzed with consultants, not just UDC team, we had um, technical specialists and experts to support and assist this work. We analyzed over 200 data layers, looking at environmentally sensitive areas, looking at flooding and inundation zone, looking at protected and conservation areas, marking out agricultural zones, because again, you don't want to simply build out where you take up lands that are needed for other important functions of the country. Uh, we looked at how we protect water supply, recognizing that as we go into possibly a drier future based on the changes brought on by climate change, that protecting our water resources, groundwater and aquifer is also important. So we took on all of these things as considerations for how we would determine the geographic basis for this and all of the physical assessments that could be done to look at other major um, government projects. We, this process included assigning suitability weights, going through models, putting together sub-models and then composite, composite models, looked at environmental um, constraints and hazards. Then we looked at infrastructure and social, socioeconomic act, um, opportunities. So we looked at both pros and cons. We layered them into sub-models, then layered them into a composite model until we had a final suitability model. I should add that in doing this final suitability, we also looked at areas where the government of Jamaica already owns or holds <clears throat> lands that could be made, made available for, for development. So out of all of this, we were able to come <clears throat> to this, which is our overall suitability, suitability map. What you're seeing here is really a high level overview, but it gives us an idea of some of the areas in Jamaica that are suitable for development. And you can see, oh, um, Put on this map also are our current, and note I'm careful to say current, 
major transportation routes and um, um, road linkages, our major ports. And we recognize that there are new um, road linkages and other options for ports and airports under consideration. Um, and those are things that will also improve. So it's again, it's a dynamic model that as we add information, it can update and renew and help us use this tool to plan not only for a single city, but for how we identify and prioritize key urban areas for investment. So you will see we have identified along here a number of other urban areas that um, um, smaller towns and cities burgeoning um, urban centers across the island, which, which would be prioritized and ranked to look at how they could also be a, get, receive investment as part of our urban futures planning. So let's talk a bit about the economic-based investigation. So they, we used a future thinkers model with the Delphi panel, um, and it looked at how we would um, have an attractive environment for investors, strategic business clusters, and all of, the, all of the things around energy, logistics, manufacturing, and agriculture, and how that would influence the development of, of any single physical location. I should add here, that we also looked at the current and proposed major investments of the government of Jamaica, because there are other projects which we recognize that while we are doing this planning, there are other projects being done by other parts of government that would have the potential to really leapfrog and take us even further into looking at what would spur a new urban center. And so some of the projects we looked at include the Vernon Field Aerotropolis in Clarendon, the main special economic zone in St. Elizabeth and the Caymanos development area in St. Catherine, we also, which also extended over to look at the Bernard Lodge development also in St. Catherine. So this brings us to talking about what are some of the things we identified would be some of core future economies and where are we as Jamaica now and where, we, where do we need to look at for investments going forward? So we, we recognize first and foremost, that we are extremely vulnerable to the effects of climate change. And therefore, as a country, we need to do our long-term planning with consideration for this in mind. And looking at things about energy, energy security, um, alternative energy, 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 you know, some of our key sectors that use energy, including resources and um, um, our transportation sector. Then we want to look at green economies and ways that we can develop in sustainable ways and look at low carbon energy systems and use of clean technology and how we have been able to initiate that and how we can promote that at greater levels going forward. So we have a couple examples here on the screen as well. I'm sorry, I'm having a little trouble moving my thing around. Okay, oops. Yes, and then how we look at disruptive technologies. Again, um, what we consider disruptive technologies 18 months ago may not be the same as they, as they are now because the COVID-19 pandemic really has forced some technology changes that we had not discussed, had not pondered before. So, you know, as Walter says, do we need to, do we need to come into office? Do I need to go out to the supermarket? I mean, I know a number of people who would never have bought groceries online before, and even now they probably would resist, but with lockdowns, Things like being able to get food delivery, grocery delivery have become increasingly important, increasingly useful. And the thing is, once you get used to these useful things, it's a little hard to go back. In Jamaica, we've recently also launched Uber, which um, Uber has recently launched in Jamaica, which shows that we are moving forward into the ride share technology. And I will tell you that me personally, I hope that in a few years, I will not have to own a car and put up a car and have a space to keep a car or rent a parking space at work to keep a car when the truth is I only need it um, an hour or two out of the day. So it's quite an investment for something I don't use that much. And so we need to get to the point where we're doing ride sharing and, and you use services as needed as opposed to long-term ownership, which we have now. Also the Bank of Jamaica has launched digital currencies. So this is really speaking to where Jamaica is going in the future, well, how we're building out now to facilitate those changes in the future. And also the Jamaica Eye, which looks at security and technology across our urban spaces and how that can help in development as well. So overall, let's talk about the major 
elements for consideration that we are looking at in planning out the future spaces, the future urban development of Jamaica. We want better governance. We'll be working towards that, um, looking at options for blue and green infrastructure, economic resilience, as well as physical resilience and social well-being, inclusion and equity. So what's next? Um, in fact, what's next is the name of what's coming up next. So next city will be, and in fact, participating in this um, webinar today with Build Better Jamaica is one of the key parts of how we will be going forward and taking this message and this, the, the groundwork that we have done, taking it forward because the next phase after the groundwork is taking through a series of public consultations, following up, updating, because as I said, things continue to change and putting in means of continuous updating as well as looking at partnerships and opportunities to take us forward. So what's next? We will continue with webinar series to have discussions about various aspects of how, how we see the future of urban growth and urban development and the next cities in Jamaica. So we will be, UDC will be leading a webinar series going forward for the rest of this year that will include town halls and consultations. I should say that the next phase beyond consultation is to go into actual detailed master planning and master planning support for possible greenfield locations, as well as support for urban renewal as part of the portfolio of um, the Ministry of Urban Renewal, Housing, Urban Renewal, Environment and Climate Change to look at what are burgeoning and emerging urban centers in Jamaica where, where the state needs to make support and intervention and then also possible greenfield sites. So we'll be looking at master planning and building that out and then seeding further development. So where, what will we be doing? We will be visioning that future together. That's a part of this whole conversation, sharing the work, the groundwork done and getting feedback, getting um, information to support the final version of planning to go forward. Looking at the future of government services, as I just said, I gave the example of Jamaica I and the, um, digital currency out of the Bank of Jamaica, as well as a number of other, um, and even ENDS, which is a government of Jamaica facilitation to bring groceries and food to people during lockdown. Um, we are, as a UDC, as, a, as an implement agents, implementation agency, looking very seriously at conservation, urban environments, and public space, particularly public green space, as a core part of our delivery to the long-term urban growth and urban development in Jamaica. I should also add that we have a partnership with UN Women to look very specifically at safe, safe cities and safe public spaces for women and girls. And indeed that we give consideration to all vulnerable groups, including um, the elderly and the differently abled as a part of, of our long-term planning both are short, medium and long-term planning, but that they're a core consideration in all the development that we do. We, give, we will give detailed thought to accessibility, connectivity and mobility, which is how, how we get around, how we are able to um, use our rights to the city, how we are able to connect one urban space to the other so that um, trade, so that um, vacations, and as described, if I no longer have to live in Kingston, could I possibly live in Portland and still uh, coming to Kingston to do some of my shopping or entertainment and then, you know, head over to Treasure Beach for vacation and that all of that can be easily done and that there's good connectivity and good mobility across the island. And of course, very important that we manage our resources and our waste. Another partnership that we're looking at is with the IDB who has launched a very awesome pivot program, the big idea to transform the Caribbean, which looks at Caribbean futures. It is based heavily on the views of youth and the, the visions of youth for, for the Caribbean futures. And so we think that aligns very well with Jamaica's next city planning. And so these are some of the, the collaborations we'll be working on to really make this next city an exciting and dynamic means of bringing long-term climate planning to the core of Jamaica's um, vision for its future. I thank you. Heather, thank you very much indeed. Uh, this is really 
an extraordinary opportunity for us in Jamaica because many of the measures that have been discussed around the world involve, involve retrofitting uh, existing cities and retrofitting quite often takes longer, costs more and may actually give you less satisfactory outcomes. The fact that we're talking about uh, a largely greenfield city, a next city, is a chance to get this right and for Jamaica to take a, a world leading role in the design of the city and next generation of cities. Well, they've had four um, really quite breathtaking presentations. It's been a remarkable scene setting for the world and the future of cities. And I think that it's very clear that cities are going to be uh, changed really quite profoundly over the next several decades. We now come to the most important part of the discussion. This is where we go open floor and we invite the most important speaker, who is of course the participants, to ask questions. Um, it would be better, you can ask direct questions to specific panelists, but it would be better if you could make general points so that we can ask all of the panelists to contribute because every issue touches on every other issue. So let's not make this too specific. Let's ask the people to raise general questions and then we'll ask all of the panelists to, to come in and with their reactions. Please indicate by raising your hand uh, so that Kevin, who is moderating the discussion, can see, and then we'll just take you in a first, first, uh, first come, first served order. I believe that uh, Robert Stevens, you're the first. Robert, you have the floor. Uh, please unmute. Uh, Robert, you seem to be having a problem with your sound. Um, <clears throat> let me see if there's anybody else ready to speak and then we'll come back to you as soon as we can. Any, anyone else coming from the floor? Oh, here's a question from the floor. It's coming in the chat. Uh, this is um, actually directed to Joe, and it says, uh, in your slide, preparing resilient cities lessons revealed by COVID, you state that equity is fundamental to health and resilience. And the question is, how do you define equity? Uh, can, can we quantify this? I'm not sure, but uh, tough question. Yeah, it's an important question. Uh, but I think that the term equity is being used increasingly you know, sort of rather than equality. And if we go back to the sort of original definitions of, of health and government responsibility for health, um, I think the WHO charter says that the government is responsible for, for creating the conditions in which all people can be as healthy as they can be. Uh, and that means understanding that there are going to be, you know, sort of genetic, uh, physical, other, you know, constraints that, that people have, but they shouldn't be constrained uh, beyond those, if you will, biological factors because of the conditions in which they live. And so the equity question means that one looks at, if you have an image, I think the one that's used a lot is a three people try to look over a fence and one of them is tall and can see over the fence. The other one's medium size and needs a bit of a step um, to see over. And the other one's a little kid who needs a taller ladder to see over. And the idea is how do we provide sort of equitable supports um, to create, um, you know, to create the, the conditions in which people have the, their best chance of being healthy. So as an example in New York, um, Mayor Bloomberg was a, called the public health mayor and was very active in, issues of you know, transportation policy, bike lanes, pedestrian walkways, measuring, um, you know, developing models really for uh, distance to parks, walking distance to parks, uh, ex, you know, exposure to, um, to uh, you know, bus transfer stations, waste transfer stations in terms of pollution. But he, the, the methods were only applied to, to Manhattan. The development was invested in Manhattan. And so when the next mayor came along, he took the lessons from how to do that, but really um, under the commissioner of health leadership, really developed, looked at where are these 
formulas that we've developed out of convenience, out of community engagement, where are they not being applied and used? And they've spent the last four to eight years really trying to create more equitable access to parks, to green space, to exercise opportunities, to public safety issues. So I think that's the, that's the idea of it. Um, Thank you very much, Joe. Uh, yes, and I noticed that, for example, with uh, COVID, there were uh, ethnic differences in the pattern of impact, uh, which um, related, I would guess, to um, the pattern of uh, employment and who was more likely to be in frontline work and patterns of underlying comorbidities. Um, there's another question coming. This is from Stanley Smelly, and it says, I, I guess this is perhaps uh, for uh, both Tanya, Walter, and Heather, it says, um, thinking about um, what, what are your thoughts regarding building a, a future city? Uh, what is the, where, are we going to have single family homes? And how can we better address the issues of land use and population density and traffic congestion? In other words, uh, are we moving from, in, in Kingston, for example, we still have a lot of last generation buildings where you have a large lot and a building where single family dwelling sitting on it. Many of these are now being bought up, demolished, and people are putting in multi-occupancy buildings. Is that the way of the future? Let's get a quick reaction from uh, Heather and then Walter and Tanya. Okay, I, I was gonna call on Tanya's um, image that she put up in her presentation, which showed you single family houses being replaced by multi multi-use multi, multi -use buildings. Um, I do think that there is a place for single family homes, Stanley. I think it may not be in the heart of the city anymore. I think as it has become more dense and as you can see, and I shouldn't even say I think, I should say I see, because the, the, regardless of what we as planners or even we as researchers project will happen, I think most important of all is to look and see what is happening in front of us. And I think as Prof Clayton just said, we are seeing single family homes are becoming more and more um, an unusual sight as the ones on nice big lots are, are, are becoming multifamily units. I mean, there are streets in Kingston right now that used to be a street of 20 single family homes that now have one or two single family homes. And I think we can see that that is being driven by, there's some amount, obviously some amount of demand that's driving that. And so it is for us to plan for it because I think one of the issues is if, if that kind of development is not regulated by the state, if there is no state intervention, then you end up with 20 lots with little cities instead of what could have been perhaps 16, 17 lots built out with multifamily housing and some good public space to complement that. Because as the densities change, other things need to change. And a lot of it can't happen only within the, permit the parameters of individual lots. And that is why the larger level planning needs to happen. And that is one of the key roles of the state. And that's why that's what um, affects things like ability to support with infrastructure and ability to, to get transportation to continue to, to be able to move around in such an in increasing density. Those are some of the things I think are critical. I do think, I don't think um, we're gonna have absolutely no um, single family homes, but we may very soon reach the point where there are little or no single family homes in the core of the city. And that, that would be a, either a luxury or a facility that you can only get on the perimeter or outside of the city core. Um, I'll just uh, add one personal note that the road I have to drive to, through to get home, all the single family homes are being demolished and they're being replaced by multi-occupancy units, but the, it's the same tiny little road. And uh, of course, the, <laughs> the traffic- And little tiny congestion. green spaces too. <laughs> and very little green space. So uh, Tanya, we need to accelerate this transition to autonomous vehicles. Otherwise I will not be able to get, <laughs> leave the neighborhood. Yes, I totally agree, Prof. And I echo the sentiments that Heather just raised. You know, I think that single family homes, not that it would be a thing of the past, but it may certainly not be a feature of the future city, so to speak, but more so on the interlands. And as you mentioned, Prof, even when we look around what's happening in Kingston and on these streets that have been where lots have been 
uh, converted to facilitate uh, multi-story buildings. Um, the traffic congestion is absolutely ridiculous. And therefore it is important that not only the infrastructure is able to keep up with this vertical development, but that the way transportation, transport services offered as well. And there has to be a shift. I mean, there are a lot of factors that will have to be addressed in making that shift more towards mass transit mm -hmm. as opposed to individual cars, um, drivers utilizing their individual cars. I'm sure on the average day you're in traffic going to work, you look next to the person in the vehicle next to you, it's just one or two persons in the vehicle. And the question is, how are we going to address this? And this will not only require addressing it from a physical infrastructure perspective, but also from a policy perspective, um, which may include or necessitate some carrots and sticks, um, which may not necessarily always be the popular decisions, but those decisions will have to be taken in ensuring that transportation is adequate for where we're going from a land use and urban layout perspective. Thank you, Tanya. Yeah. Um, you go anywhere in our city and you can see vehicles that weigh maybe half a ton being used to carry someone that weighs maybe 150 pounds. Uh, almost all the fuel we burn is actually moving the vehicle, not the person. And if we can find a better, more efficient way to do this, that would be great. But Joe, can we ask you, are there health implications? Uh, we see an increasingly densely populated urban core. What does this mean with regard to future pandemics and infectious disease? Well, again, as I said, I think what we learned from COVID is the density in and of itself is not a negative. And there's a lot of work on this. There's been a lot of debate about it because the term density is used um, you know, without uh, a lot. And so I think a lot of people who looked at it, it's really about the design of dense dwellings uh, rather and the and the crowding up within units that's what we saw in a lot of cities as multi-generational families in a small apartment um, which had implications for a lot of issues in terms of the in in addition to digitization and others um, but i think one of the there are some interesting concepts um, to deal with the density question which um, are sort of looking there's in coming out of europe um, the sort of 15 minute community that anything people need should be within 15 minutes of walking distance, which eliminates the need for vehicles altogether. And a lot of the urban design uh, folks are looking at, you know, what are sort of the core commercial services? What are the sort of core recreational services, schools, et cetera, healthcare facilities that could be created in, a, in a sort of geographic areas and geographic communities um, that could uh, provide services to a more dense housing unit, but within walking distance or biking distance and just obviate the need for motorized vehicles completely. Thank you very much, Joe. Um, new topic, Javon Henry has asked whether we should be thinking about hydrogen fuel public transport versus electric vehicles. Uh, Walter, I think this one is for you. Uh, you're muted. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> you had to do it once. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm really a natural on that one. Um, yes, um, hydrogen is, 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 is a very, very popular um, alternative to fossil fuels at the moment. Um, I think from an environment perspective, we need to be careful that um, hydrogen is not a, a form of energy production or a source of, of a fuel. It's a way to store energy. Um, so we need to think about where the energy is coming from that we need to convert the normal energy into hydrogen. And we then need to figure out where and how we can, we can allocate the hydrogen parts. And within that, we also have the um, great lesson from the current transition from fossil fuels into renewable energies that says, we should not put all of, of um, our baskets into uh, all of our eggs into the one basket of one kind of technology. So one fossil fuel plant um, for the whole country, I think that's, that's over. Um, so we should think about um, wind energy, um, solar energy, maybe, maybe wave, um, maybe geothermal, all as, as, as contributing to the energy mix, which then provides stability in terms of energy security through the balancing of that. And within that, I can see the next lesson from that that says, if you have a diversification of 
sources of um, um, energy for electri electricity. I think we should also find the diversity of um, um, ways in which we can store the electrical energy. And we can store them either in terms of heat um, through um, um, uh, concentrate solar power uh, power stations. We can con uh, we can store the electricity in terms of batteries, or we can store it in terms of hydrogen. Um, there are a couple of projects going on in 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 Scotland, in Germany, and in in Italy, which are using hydrogen as a way to um, store excess or surplus um, 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 electricity from the solar panels when the sun is really shining um, or, or from the wind, wind farms um, when the wind is really blowing the hooli. And I think within that, it would then make sense to um, target the use of hydrogen um, as, a, as, a, as a high energy to weight ratio um, form for particular parts of, of, of um, um, energy uses. So I would not adv um, advocate um, the use of hydrogen as a general replacement for everything. But hydrogen-driven bus, sure, um, but not for but but not a hydrogen-driven um, 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 power station because, from an energy perspective, from an environmental perspective, that doesn't make a sense. So we should also think about ways in which we then can use maybe batteries for one kind of um, um, electricity use. Um, um, hydrogen um, bottles for, for something else and so on and so on. Um, the projects up in Scotland um, are uh, up, up in the Orkneys are absolutely fantastic on that one. They saw initially the um, electric vehicles they have there <clears throat> as a way to distribute electricity ac across, the, across the islands. So during the day, somebody would drive the near empty um, battery in the car um, to the um, to the office in the office they plug it in, um, charge the battery, drive home, and then the electricity from the car battery would power the house. Um, you know, um, simply as a way to allocate um, things, and, and I think the uh, electricity, electrical energy, and I think hydrogen has a fantastic opportunity to contribute to models like that. But I don't think the conversion losses are are good enough that we can use um, electric uh, hydrogen as a fuel for, for absolutely everything in the same way as we're currently using um, fossil fuel for absolutely everything. Thank you very much, Walter. Uh, one of the amazing things that can happen when we electrify the whole vehicle fleet is that our vehicle fleet then becomes our main means of storing electricity. And if they're autonomous as well, then the vehicle can decide when it needs to go and get a top up and when electricity prices are high, the vehicle can go and sell electricity. So every vehicle then becomes a spot market trader in the power market. And uh, that is going to be a very different way of relating to your vehicle. Your vehicle could be out there making money for you, except of course, you won't own it. So it'll be making money for itself. Right, this is next question. It is a very top level. This is very sensitive and this is very political. So we're going to direct it at Heather. This is from Robert Stevens. He says, what are we going to do about upgrading our slums? Now, for those people who are not in Jamaica, we have, what, 20, 25% of our population living in informal settlements. And so the question comes up, should we be using our scarce resources to upgrade these informal settlements and regularize them? Or should we be investing in a new city? This is uh, one of these big decisions. So let's ask Heather for her reaction. Okay, thank you for that question. Let me just say that um, I, I am always very careful to, to not or to not lean on what about, because there are always important things to be done. There will always be important things to be done. And I think that, uh, let me not say I think, and the government has shown its commitment to addressing informal settlements um, across the islands. There has been significant funding and significant investment in um, informal settlements recently. And I, again, I can't speak with authority. I, I, I am the head of an implementation agency, not a part of the, of the policy direction of the government. So that may be a question better suited for, to get a detailed answer from the policy leaders or the policy entities. Um, the Ministry of Urban Renewal, Housing, Urban Renewal, Environment, and Climate Change, as I had mentioned, is the center for that kind of response. We have been collaborating with them at looking at 
a number of ways that we can look at including housing of every type, mixed housing, social housing, um, and those are the ways that we will address informal settlements in, in the larger term um, urban planning. And so that, that really is policy direction, which I don't think I can answer in great detail. However, we, do have, we have seen in recent years significant investment through entities such as the Housing Agency of Jamaica, with funding from entities such as Tourism Enhancement Fund, with significant investments being made in addressing um, informal settlements. That is something I think that would be, is worthy of a whole other um, session, perhaps, Prof, because um, housing and inequity in, this, in the city and informal settlement is a big topic. So I think that is something that would require far more detailed review, but just to say that it is not one or the other, but that the government recognizes that while it is important to deal with the current urgent matters, there is also room to look very importantly at our long-term planning. And that is really the core of what I um, was presenting about today. Thanks. Thank you, Heather. So in fact, equity comes in in a number of ways. It comes in in the provision of, of housing. It comes in in the need to upgrade the, the uh, such circumstances for people who are living in, in, in really intolerable conditions at the moment. And of course, as Joe raised, <clears throat> equity is a critical issue in terms of, uh, of healthcare and uh, health status and access to healthcare. Okay, new topic now, another very important one from Ava Gail Gardner. She says, as uh, we increase housing density, what plans or provisions are we making to increase water supply? Now we've looked at the fact that we're, we're seeing all these buildings going up and we're not seeing a commensurate upgrade of the transport infrastructure. Uh, water is an, perhaps an even more serious issue. Um, <clears throat> uh, the Water Commission is now, I believe, the country's largest consumer of electricity uh, because we're pumping water to uphill to people who live in high ground and on the top floors of buildings. And uh, there have been several occasions in the recently when the Water Commission's actually been unable to pay its electricity bill. So we're incurring a lot of cost by allowing housing building development to go ahead without making appropriate provision for um, stepping up the water supply or alternatively, making a transition to rainwater harvesting and grey water systems. Let's have a quick go around. Can we ask Walter to come in on this one first and then we'll go to Heather. Ah. Um, it's, it's, it's always kind of nice to ask somebody who doesn't live in Jamaica to answer specific Jamaica um, <laughs> questions. Um, and um, yes, um, I, I think, of course, there has to be appropriate water provision. I mean, there's, there's not, not very much around that. Um, I think the um, economic case, case for um, the uh, paying paying the electricity bill, I think is is, is also changed. Um, one of the delightful things, and, and I think some of our um, participants probably can say more and then better things about that. But one of the delightful things about renewable energies is that there are very very few feedstock costs <clears throat> and um, very low operating costs. So that means that once installed. Um, the cost profile of renewable energy is very, very different. So the question then is the transition from um, renewable from, from fossil fuel energy to renewable energy really is a question about how can we pay the fixed costs from the start? Um, and that probably would, would suggest that um, the water board or the water company um, might, might in the future find it easier because um, um, with with the greater proliferation of renewable energy, I think the bills should come should come down. Um, the logistics of of getting the water over to um, um, to individual users, I think, is a, is a, is a different question for that. And um, if there are um, if, if there are greater tendencies for for greater um, uh, urban densities, then I think. The provision of water needs, needs, of course, to be commensurately increased. But from a health perspective and from a well-being perspective, the disposal of, of the, the, the water effluent also has to be managed in a, in a proper way. So you need to look at both sides of, of, of the equation. 
And um, yeah, um, that absolutely is something that needs to be looked at. Thank you, Walter. Heather, what's your view? Uh, well, I will just, I, I, well, I really think my, I, before I get specifically into water, I want to just address, because I see some other questions that are essentially saying, why consider a new city? What about water? What about social services? What about education in our existing? And I mean, I think I, I suspect a number of the questions will say, what about this? And uh, we're in no way, in no way denying that those things are not important. Nor am, I in, nor am I suggesting that funds are being diverted from what is needed urgently to do this. In fact, what I have uh, presented is some baseline work that has been done and we're going through a consultative process. The actual implementation may not happen for many years because our implementation timeline had been uh, you know, 10, 15, 20 years before, that was before the pandemic. Now that there's a pandemic, and know that there has been such significant economic shocks to Jamaica, I want to just make clear that it is not that there are additional funds being um, sent over to creating this new um, fantastic glass city somewhere that nobody is in. I just want to um, address that clear concern and instead to make it clear that what is, what is being done is looking at long-term climate change resilience planning for Jamaica because climate change continues to be and is a very real threat to Jamaica. We as a country have already made significant investments in and around areas that are very at risk from the projected effects of climate change and therefore it behooves us and that is the work the UDC has been doing to look at what, what is the future state and how can we plan for it. And I also want to make clear that the intention is not to build a single greenfield city. While that is a possibility, in doing this work and in um, going through this pandemic, we recognize that an, uh, an, an important alternate is to look at burgeoning, growing, and developing urban centers across the island, which should be prioritized for investment. So there may be urban centers that we identify based on their location, based on their population, based on their economic base that are suitable for more government intervention. And therefore in deciding things like where in doing distribution of water supply, in addressing social services, in building out a new hospital, for example, it helps the government in its long-term planning. So that I just want to qualify, I explain that this is not an, an attempt to take lots of much needed money at this time and build a, a huge white elephant somewhere on a greenfield site. That's not what's happening here. This is long-term planning. So regarding water specifically and any other thing that we can say, so what about the needs in Kingston or what about the needs in, in Montego Bay or what about the needs in the existing in cities? We are in no way discrediting that. And indeed, as I said, we are, we are working very closely with our portfolio ministry, the Ministry of Economic Growth and Job Creation, and with the new ministry, Ministry of Housing, Urban Renewal, Environment and Climate Change to address those current present, pre pressing needs, but that we are also keeping an eye on future state planning. And just briefly that the NWC, I am aware, is doing major financial um, planning to do investments, to bring more water distribution and supply to our urban centers. But I mean, NWC would be able to speak about that in a little more detail. I wouldn't have all those details with me here. All right, thank you. Thank you very much for clarifying that, Heather. I'm sure you'll have to give that explanation many more times as this discussion goes on. Um, we, we are, get, and we are, I'm afraid now, um, at the end pretty much, but may I just uh, raise one more, one final topic and ask all the panelists for a quick comment. How many of the issues that we've been discussing um, can actually, or can, can we use technology to solve many of these problems? For example, we know how to build buildings which have net zero energy demand because they're generating as much power as they use. We can get quite close to buildings <clears throat> which, um, well, for example, we can incorporate rainwater, rainwater harvesting, uh, water storage, uh, filtration, solar powered filtration, 
and uh, grey water systems to actually greatly reduce the demand for an external supply of water. And in other countries, we've seen a transition to intensive agriculture, which can actually be freed from the, um, <clears throat> from the previous um, uh, constraint of needing requiring land. We've seen agricultural buildings, for example, uh, agricultural units built on top of roofs. And as we move to more um, high technology forms of food production, for example, um, bacterial food production, um, but using bacteria as a base to make proteins, we can actually start to see how maybe cities could be generating a lot of their own food supply as well. And as we see the transition to autonomous vehicles, well, by some estimates, we could take the number of vehicles on the roads by down by maybe 80% and still get all of the people and freight movements that we do now. So do the technologies currently in the pipeline give us a, or offer the, a way that we can solve many of the problems of urban living in future? Let's just get a, a final comment from all of the panelists. Can we start with you, Joan? Well, I guess two comments. One, I think, um... I think the answer is yes. I mean, we're increasingly technology is able to tackle a lot of the health related issues, but the equity question about access to technology um, and, and investment in the infrastructure, and it isn't necessarily an easy path. I mean, the technology is there, but it, there are infrastructure issues. And we saw that with the digital divide um, during COVID. And the second thing I'd say is I think the element of human and community engagement in use of technology is the other piece that's really, really important so that when you have it, people begin to use it and embrace it and uh, it becomes sort of part of the way of way of life rather than some um, sort of exotic activity that is only available to uh, a small slice of the population. Thank you. So sorry, I was muted that time. Tanya. Thank you, Joe. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Prof. I do think that technology certainly stands a, a great chance in helping to addressing helping to address some of the issues that we identified. Certainly from a transport perspective, as Joe just pointed out, it is critical though that you know equity is at the center and that the technology is not seen just as a novelty of you know something that's available to only a few but that it be acknowledged that it really must be incorporated into our day-to-day -day lives. So the infusion of the technology and how that happens, I think is going to be critical. Technology, I think, will have an implication for how the demand is, is managed or is addressed, as well as how transport, for example, is managed in a manner that, include, that it improves safety as well as efficiency. This will not happen overnight. Certainly it's a process, but I'm hopeful that technology and the change that's required to fully incorporate the technology will be critical to creating the cities that we need and the cities that will operate effectively for the future. Thank you very much, Tanya. Walter. Right, um, and I'm not muted. Um, I, I think um, <clears throat> it, it would be easy for me to say, oh, this is the wrong question, and here's why. Um, because I don't think it, it is really about um, the technology, it's about how humans are in, engaging with and interacting with technology. And what technology fetishists, including everybody in my faculty, or most people in my faculty of engineering, um, tend to, to um, favor a technological solution for technical problems. And what in those situations happens is that the behavior of individuals and the engagement of in individuals with that technology is changing, and that redefines the entire problem. Um, so I, I keep saying everybody talks about sustainable development being such a huge and phenomenally difficult topic. Yet um, we have um, one company who found out that um, um, found found a way to to let two billion people disclose their personal data, their private lives, 
um, to everybody in Sundry in a way that, you know, any state or any government would be immediately be criticized for an Ovalian state, you know, um, and then that's just the way we engage with Facebook. Um, so if we want to, to um, if, if I'm optimistic, I would say absolutely. Um, technology is a very, very supportive um, thing. The technology also has its own dynamic and its own, and its, and its own logic. And we need to make sure that um, it is not the capacity to, to do things with technology that drives us, but the desire to improve livelihoods and, and livability of places um, that, that really shapes, sh shapes the agenda. And within that, um, as a, as a closing thought, I'm 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 really um, impressed by hundred states um, who, in the last eighteen months, um, faced a serious problem, and they actually found collectively, nationally, regionally, um, some form of, of 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 health response. And if somebody had told me about four years ago that um, whole countries are gonna shut down the entire economic activity and um, only let it happening again if completely, complete and radical changes to lifestyles are gonna come about. I would think these people have had too much of the local rum and cola. Um, you know, I mean, that, that, that uh, would, would, would never happen because people are, I mean, you can't just stop economic activity. Right. Now, now, if you can do that, and then if nationally and as a society we have the um, the gumption, the courage, and and the the um, the vision to say, okay, we've got to stop what we do at the moment. We've got to do something else. Then I think the, that message has a great message of hope in there. That actually, if you can do that stuff, then maybe we can also find better ways um, to to interact with each other um, outside COVID, post COVID. Um, in cities or in other rural areas. So I think for sustainable development, there are great opportunities to be had. Thank you, Walter. Okay, Heather, we'll give you the final word. Is it technology or people? I, I'm sure you'll say both, but I'll give you. <laughs> well, you know what I'm gonna say, it's not just technology because you know, it is, it is really about all of us um, individually and collectively. And um, I, I, to follow on Walter's point, I think, the pandemic, um, the, this, this pandemic that we have gone through for the past uh, what, 15, 16 months really shows us how individual decisions can have huge rippling effect. And uh, so it is important that we appeal not only to the collective, but to the individual, because I do believe, I firmly believe that individual decision and action can lead to um, worldwide change. However, regarding technology, I, I think technology, particularly in the Jamaican context, is an important part of moving us forward. But technology it has to be accessible, has to be reliable, has to be affordable. Um, so it, it makes no sense for us to build out awesome, useful apps and things that the average person can't access, can't, can't use, and um, their credit runs out before they've, they've you know, finished ordering their groceries. So we, we, you know, we need to get to the, to the point where it's the technology must have that um, foundation to support it. Something we recognize is an issue in a small island developing state like Jamaica. And there are others, you know, there are something like 91 countries that are considered least developed, landlocked, small island. And th they are the ones that um, the technology will not touch everyone unless we address the, um, the, the equity issues, as I mean, Joe has said it over and over and over, the, the equity, we, we must be able to access it. It must be reasonably affordable, you know, and it must be reliable. So, you know, it can't be that we agree to all work from home. And then, you know, while I'm home, the internet drops, you know, it, it, it means that you, you, you can't do the things that you want to do or only a certain amount of society will be able to do it. And, you know, it is very important that in building it out, we think of all sectors. You know, we saw a number of people ask questions about, you know, so what about people in informal settlements? What about people who can't access? What about social services? And those are things that we must consider in every kind of, um, of, of, of future visioning, both for improvement of what exists and what may come in the future. So, you know, we, we, we all have to work together. It's, it's a together effort. And... Um, 
I'm so grateful for this opportunity. It is an introduction, Prof. I know that this is called an introduction because it is a conversation that must continue. Thank you. Thank you very much, Heather. Uh, you know, one of the things that made this so clear recently, just to support the point that you raised and Joe raised, is uh, what happened to children's education during the pandemic. For those, uh, some children have got parents who have got uh, books at home, who've got time to invest in the education of their children, who've got good internet access, and their education was not as badly disrupted. We have many people in this country whose uh, children basically missed a year and a half of education. And uh, we are going to be living with the consequences of that years to come. There'll be many, many children who are not going to get um, who are going to leave school probably without qualifications, and then there will be all sorts of social problems attendant on that in many, many years, for many years to come. So this issue of um, building inequity in everything that we do is becoming increasingly essential. But may I thank our four speakers, Professor Joe Ivy Wooford, Tanya Bedward, Dr. Walter Dermar, and Heather Pinnock. Thank you to the organizations who've supported our work and made this webinar possible. The Inter-Academy Partnership, the Inter-American Network of Academies of Science, the Caribbean Academy of Science, and a big shout out to the Urban Development Corporation. Thank you to everybody who participated. The questions have been outstanding. This has been a really um, wonderful discussion. The good news is, is that this will not be the last webinar on this topic. This is only the opening salvo. Uh, as Heather explained, the UDC will be using this one to kick off a whole series, look at all of these issues in more detail. And our team at the University of the West Indies have got new projects already in development, and we will be disseminating these results via publications and further webinars. I look forward to working with everybody here in future. And for those of you who have participated and participated with uh, brilliant questions, that, that just to remind you that this whole webinar is going to be available on YouTube and the presentations and material will be made available. Guys, thank you so much. It's been a wonderful discussion and I look forward very much to seeing you all at the next one. Thank you and good day. Thank you, Prof. Thank you, everyone. Have a good thank rest you. of the day. Thank you, thank you. Okay, um, that's it, thanks, bye-bye. Okay, everything's all right? All right, yes. Was it okay, was it all right? Everybody's gone. <laughs> yeah, um, but, but I'm on, I, I, I mean, you're okay, everything's fine? Yes. Good. Thank you, thank you again. Thank you, enjoy, bye. Bye. Okay, uh, Kevin, are you hearing me? Yep. Okay, man. No, yes.